The focus for this presentation is feedback for better student performance. Feedback is an important dimension of teaching, and it is intertwined with assessment and grading. Providing students with constructive feedback is an essential component of the online teacher's interactions with students. We're going to spend some time looking at how to give feedback. First, let's think about how we might define feedback. Some define feedback as a consequence of performance. You do something, and you get information about how you did it and how you can improve. That's a simple definition and it's good enough for our purposes. But let's also consider instruction. There are several ways to offer instruction, giving lectures, assigning readings, designing experiences. What these approaches share is that they help to convey information and, hopefully, understanding to our students. But how is feedback related to instruction? Hattie and Timperley suggest thinking of a continuum of instruction and feedback. At one end, there is a clear distinction between providing instruction and providing feedback. However, when feedback is combined with a more correctional view, the feedback and instruction become intertwined. Another concept that gets tangled up with feedback is assessment. It's common to think of assessment as judging student performance in some way and assigning a rating, but that certainly isn't always the case. In the BBST courses, students get a lot of feedback about improving their performance, but, except for borderline cases, there's only one assessment at the very end of the course that actually counts for a lot. All of the other assessment is formative. By that, I mean that the assessment takes place as learning occurs, and the purpose for any assessments within the course is to promote that learning. As I mentioned, most of the assessment in BBST courses is formative. We have quizzes that, except for borderline cases, don't really count towards the complete, incomplete decision. The quizzes are to help students focus their attention on the videos and, in many cases, to raise awareness of alternate perspectives. Often, the questions prompt students to more precise reading of questions. In the Foundations course, this serves a couple of purposes. Not only does a capacity for precise reading help students be a better tester, it also helps to prepare them for subsequent courses in the BBST series. In addition, we try to model the course exercises and activities, both individual and group, after authentic real-world tasks. As BBST students engage in these activities, they interact with each other, critiquing and reviewing each other's work as they go along. In many cases, they return to their own work, carrying the insights they've gained from their peers to consider how they would now handle the challenge. In the BBST courses, the final answer and the insight it reflects is far more important than the first draft answer or the one the tester came up with without help. In the BBST course, even the final exams are designed with formative assessment in mind. In the exam cram forum, students start drafting answers to final exam questions from the beginning of the course. At least, that's what we hope they will do. We want them to consider as many good ideas for answering a question as the class can offer. We want them to understand how their answers might change according to contexts. We want them to understand competing views and honest differences of opinion. We also want them to think carefully about the content of the lectures and to feel free to share well-reasoned arguments. Throughout all of this, the point of everything students do in the BBST courses is to learn something. It's not until the BBST students get to the end of the course in the final exam that assessment is summative. Summative assessment is where performance is evaluated at a given point. In many cases, there are consequences to summative assessment. The assessment affects a grade or a pass-fail decision. Summative assessment is really just an attempt to capture a measure of student knowledge at a given point of time. It's a snapshot. For BBST students, that given point in time is at the final exam. If a student clearly demonstrates understanding, we say they successfully completed the course. In the ideal case, students give strong performance throughout the course and pass with flying colors. It's easy to assess their work, and informal methods work pretty well. But what happens when a student's performance is not that strong? What if an instructor looks at some student work and thinks, I'm not sure about this one? That's where formal assessment methods are useful, and we'll briefly touch on those in another presentation. Here's a quote from Robert Stake that illustrates the distinction between formative and summative assessment. When the cook tastes the soup, that's formative. When the guests taste the soup, that's summative. Let's return to feedback now. I want to be clear that most of the feedback in the BBST courses is intertwined with instruction. We're going to spend a lot of time on using feedback for instructional purposes. Let me start by saying that there's a lot of research support for the statement that feedback is important to learning and improving performance. It seems easy to agree with that. However, there have also been a number of reports that say feedback has no effect or even a debilitating effect on learning. Given that we tend to think feedback is a good thing, we need to try to understand how to avoid giving feedback in ways that have a debilitating effect. We know some of the things that cause problems with feedback. If feedback is too vague, it's unhelpful. If it's excessively critical or controlling, it can be damaging. So how do we do feedback well? 
Frustratingly, even that is a little murky. What's good for one student isn't necessarily good for another student. Feedback should be specific and detailed, but not too specific and detailed. Feedback should be immediate, except when delayed feedback is better. One of my favorite writings on feedback is an article by Hattie and Timperley. This model is in that article. These folks have offered this model to help us give more effective feedback. Let's walk through it, starting at the top with the purpose. When we give feedback, we're trying to close the distance between the student's current understanding or performance and the goal we have for them. The students have a large role in closing this gap. We hope they'll close it by increasing their efforts or getting better at whatever it is they're trying to learn, but they can also close the gap by abandoning the goal entirely. There's no gap, after all, if there's no goal. No teacher likes to see that happen, but it does sometimes. The teachers can help close the gap by giving students appropriately challenging goals and helping students reach those goals by teaching relevant strategies and giving feedback. Hattie and Timperley offer three questions that help us give more effective feedback. The first question has to do with helping students understand where they're going with their performance. These are goals. Hattie and Timperley refer to this as feed up. The second question answers students who ask, how am I going or how am I doing? This is feedback. It looks at recent but past performance. The third and final question tells the student where to next. Hattie and Timperley refer to this as feed forward. As an instructor uses these questions to guide feedback, he or she can work at four different levels of the student's performance. The task level helps students understand how well they understand specific concepts or perform tasks. At the process level, the instructor focuses on the main processes needed to understand or perform tasks. For example, did the student skip a step or complete a step incorrectly? Self-regulation refers to someone's ability to monitor their own performance. An instructor can give a student tips and strategies for better self-regulation. Finally, the self-level is the personal, but typically very vague, personal evaluations and perceptions a student has about him or herself. This is my niece. I had just read the Hattie and Timperley article on feedback before spending a weekend with this young lady. I learned a lot from her. To illustrate the bottom portion of the Hattie and Timperley model, I want to share a few snapshots from an afternoon with her. She was six years old at the time. Here's the model again. First, I'll describe something from my afternoon with my niece. Try to figure out for yourself which level I'm describing before I give you the answer. Here's the first one. This level of feedback is a tricky proposition. It has little to no effect on learning, yet a lot of students want to hear feedback at this level. If it's done poorly, it can backfire and actually get in the way on down the road. If you're going to give this kind of feedback, and you might have to do that, try to reinforce the behavior or attitude that you want to reinforce. Here's an example from my weekend with Ellie. Ellie was getting ready to go to her friend's birthday party and was making a birthday card to go along with the present. Ellie asked her mom for the directory from her school. The adults in the room didn't understand why she wanted the directory, markers, crayons, fresh paper. These we understood for the task, but not the school directory. Ellie's mom asked the question we all had. Why do you want the school directory? Ellie explained, because I don't know how to spell Lila's name and I want to find it in the directory so I can copy it for Lila's birthday card. My sister immediately got the school directory for her daughter and said, what a great idea. You're such a good problem solver. To parse this feedback, we might say, what a great idea could backfire later. Ellie might come to believe that only great ideas are worth having. That's the kind of problem this level of feedback can create. But her mom didn't stop there. She went on to say, You are such a good problem solver, which we hope reinforces Ellie's image as a girl who can figure out how to get around the problems that come her way. This is self-level feedback. Generally, teachers should avoid it, but in Ellie's mom's case, she used it to reinforce a desired behavior, problem solving. Here's the next one. At the time, Ellie was learning to add and subtract. She handed me a page from a children's workbook to show me a bunch of subtraction problems that she had answered. Each and every one of them was correct, and that's what I told her. Ellie, you answered every single problem correctly. There's not one mistake on the whole page. That was confirmatory feedback directed at one of these levels. Which one was it? Well, that was task level feedback. The next level focuses on how to do the task at a more general level. Here's another example. We met Uncle Kem at Panera's where he had been working while she was at her friend's birthday party. While she was waiting for Uncle Kem to finish an email message, she was looking a little bored. She was very excited about doing math, so I asked her if she wanted me to give her some math problems while we waited for Uncle Kem to finish up. Well, as far as she was concerned, that was a fantastic idea. It turns out that she hadn't gotten to the eights in her workbook yet, but I didn't know that. I gave her a problem like 8 minus 3, and she said, I don't know how to do eights yet. And I responded, well, you do all the numbers the same way. Start with the number on the top, take away the number on the bottom, and see what you have left. Go ahead and give it a try. She tried it, and it worked. So in this scenario, I gave her a little dab of instruction and then another shot of task-level feedback when she got the answer right. 
However, if she had had trouble with the problem I put out for her, I might have helped her focus on how she was doing the task, and given her feedback targeted very precisely on the problem in front of her. For example, I could have put some sugar packets on the table and asked her to use them to show me how she figured out the problem. Once I saw where she was having trouble, I could have used the sugar packets to help her see how to solve problems like this. That is process level feedback. And here's the last one. Using formal vocabulary, a subtraction problem starts with a minuend, takes away a subtrahend, and leaves us with the difference. Ellie was pretty excited about her success at math, but she was not yet as confident about subtraction as she was about addition. When she asked me to check a problem she had just solved, I didn't do it for her. I asked her instead whether she wanted to learn a trick to let her check problems for herself. She liked that idea and was ready to learn it, so I showed her the trick where you add the difference and the subtrahend to see if you get the minuend as a result. Now, I didn't use those terms with her, but I told her to add the bottom two numbers to see if she got the answer at the top. If her answer matched the top number, I explained, she could be sure the difference is right. In this case, I gave Ellie a strategy to use to check her own work. Which level of feedback is that? Well, it's self-regulation feedback. Of course, I quickly moved to task level feedback and coached her as she tried this trick on the next problem too. And feedback is often like that. You move back and forth between the different levels. As an instructor, you try to be careful not to give too much information because when you overwhelm your student, or your niece, it's counterproductive. Now I've just used easy to understand examples from simple math to illustrate the different levels of feedback. If you reflect on the anecdotes I shared, I think you'll find that Ellie's mom and I also touched on the three questions regarding feed up, feed back, and feed forward. Look for these in some of your interactions at home or work over the next several days. We've already touched on questioning strategies. Keep this feedback model in mind to help you craft more effective questions. For more on feedback, please refer to the instructor's manual, General Information, and look up the Hattie and Temperley article I mentioned. Complete citation information is available in the instructor's manual and in your list of readings.